All right, I see folks starting to roll in, so we'll give it a minute or so before we dive in, but thanks to everyone for joining us today on our webinar for planning a virtual lobby day. And as folks are joining, if you want to throw into the chat uh, where you're joining us from or what organization you're with, uh, that would be great. And we can know who our audience is and, and uh, get ready to answer your questions. Great, looks like we've got St. Louis here, March of Dimes organization. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us. We look like we got a good number here. We'll give them just another minute or so before we dive in. Oh, we've got a lot of Minnesota folks here. Join our two speakers. Some fellow medical associations. Come chat with Dave. Justin from Friends Committee on National Legislation joined us last year to speak on this topic. I know they run an awesome virtual lobby day at the Friends Committee. Awesome. So looks like we've got a bunch of folks here. I want to make sure we make the most of our time today. So I'm going to dive in. Here we go. Oh. I'm not Ian Rutledge, that is left over from an old slide. My name is Teresa Hebert and I am the Director of Communications at Quorum. Uh, you all may receive emails from me in your inbox, um, but I put together Quorum's content on our blog, our case studies. Um, so along with webinars like this today, I'm always looking for your ideas. So send them my way. I'm joined by Dave Showers, the Senior Manager of Advocacy Development at the American Academy of Neurology, and Megan Form Forbes, the Legislative Counsel at the Institute for Justice. I'm really excited to be joined by Dave and Megan today because they both run really awesome advocacy programs, but programs that are really different. Dave's team runs an awesome federal uh, fly-in every year on an annual basis with their association members, uh, bringing them here to DC or virtually to DC uh, to speak about issues um, that AA and members care about. Megan's team works at the state level and they run a lot of coalition focused days at the Capitol where uh, as bills are moving and they urgently need action, they're bringing folks to meet legislators and staff in person. So we've got federal and state perspectives, we've got association members and coalition members, uh, we've got annual programs, we've got kind of more rapid fire programs. So they bring really unique perspectives that I think can cover a lot of what organizations today can need. Um, so we're going to dive in. So we're going to start with Dave. Um, after, we'll have Dave talk about his team's program for about 15 minutes. Then we'll turn it over to Megan to talk about the Institute for Justice's work. And then we'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So as you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A box, uh, and I will get to them uh, either as they come or at the end. Uh, so feel free to throw them in there as you have them. Uh, so Dave, before we start off, could you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your role? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks for having me. Um, as it said on the slide, uh, Dave Showers, Senior Manager, Advocacy Development at the AAN. I've been with the AAN for over 13 years and leading our fly-ins for seven years. Um, I'm located in our Minneapolis headquarters, and I do work closely with our Washington, D.C. office and our advocacy team to coordinate these advocacy events and engagement efforts with our members. Um, that's about it for me. I will hand it over to Megan for her introduction. Thanks, Dave. And hi, everyone. It's great to meet you. My name is Megan Forbes. I'm legislative counsel at the Institute for Justice. We're a nonprofit public interest law firm that works to protect civil liberties. And as legislative counsel, I work at state legislatures across the country to advance civil liberties through legislation. And I primarily work on legislation to advance economic liberty. So a lot of times I'm working with people trying to help lift barriers that are keeping them from earning a living. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today and share some of the strategies that we've employed over the last two years during the pandemic and talk about some of the challenges and opportunities that we've seen. Awesome, thank you again both for joining us. 
Um, so Dave, to start off, wondering if you can tell us what the typical AAN fly-in uh, looks like and how it fits into your wider advocacy work uh, at the organization. Absolutely. So we host two fly-in events annually. Um, about 200 attendees or a little more in, in our spring winter event called Neurology on the Hill. And then we host a fall event called the Legislative Summit. And that's about 100 attendees. Um, so really the goals and kind of how it fits with our overall advocacy plan, um, probably similar to many others, to educate members of Congress on issues that are important to our organization. Um, specifically, you know, what is neurology? What is the role of neurologists in the healthcare system? And then of course, to make an impact on the priority issues that are asks that we're bringing. Uh, to the table at these events. And then also AN member education and networking. I think this is very important. Um, you know, we all want to be in person, but virtually we can still uh, make an impact on this and really creating those key advocacy contacts from across the country that we can lean on as an association when, when needed uh, to make that impact. Um, and these events, uh, these fly-ins paired with the efforts of our, our lobbyists in DC, our political action committee, our in-district program that we do, um, they really allow us to make an impact year round. And I think that that's important. Um, you know, our typical format for our, our uh, main fly-in is, is Sunday to Tuesday. Um, you know, have committee meetings, receptions on Sunday. Uh, Monday's a full day of training and practice on those issues, speakers, members of Congress speak. And then Tuesday's our day on the Hill. Um, our fall event is a little bit different. Um, it's an invitation only event. Uh, the other one is just application based open to any members. Um, so we, we have this one a little more focused in the fall, um, try to really make an impact on issues that are moving at that time. And we try to invite leaders in the organization, those that maybe haven't participated in the past and pair them with some of our stronger, those uh, advocates, those key contacts. Um, so a very similar format, just a little bit pared down. Um, and it's, it's been a positive addition for us adding this second fly-in. Uh, and we've been able to impact issues later in the year, like I, like I mentioned. Um, and virtually, it's allowed us to increase the, the participation. Yeah, I love how you mentioned that, I think when we think of lobby days and fly-ins, our first instinct is always those meetings with officials and staff. But I, I love that you painted it as, it's not just that, it's also member education, it's member networking. Uh, that that portion of going to the Capitol, whether that's in DC or in the States, is one fraction of the value that these have to the folks who attend. Um, so you touched on this a little bit, um, but can you tell us how your fly-ins have transitioned since COVID uh, and how you've adapted now that we've done this two or three times uh, in a virtual or a hybrid setting? Absolutely. So we we had to adapt, of course. We can't, we can't uh, do nothing during this time. So we have held three virtual fly-ins and you know, hopefully I can share a few of the best practices um, that we've learned. Definitely have learned a lot. Preparation, of course, for any event is important, um, but you know, hopefully these few things will help you succeed if, if you have or have not uh, done a virtual fly-in. So I think number one, uh, ask your participants to commit to blocking their schedule for the entire day. Um, it sounds simple, but you know, reaching out or people that apply or that we invite, they'll say, you know, I'm a, you know, they're busy physicians, but I, I'm open from noon to two um, during the Hill Day. Can you fit in my three meetings? And obviously, most of you know, chances are slim that that would happen. So I think, you know, asking them, encouraging them to treat this as an in-person event um, where you would take the time to actually fly to DC, to take that time, commit, block your schedule, and and you're more flexible that way too. We've seen uh, virtual meeting times change a little bit more. So um, they might, you know, shift by a few hours. And it's just really, uh, really nice for the members experience as well to just have that have that day blocked. Um, for, for the issue training or whatever you do to help prepare your members, um, we scheduled that a week in advance to our Hill Day. So um, we record that, we do it on Zoom. And it's really nice for those that can't be on that live session that they can see it or those that want to refer back if they did attend live. And then we also, in that week leading up, we hosted Q&A and practice sessions on, on Zoom. So, you know, it's really important that 
participants practice in their delegations. Um, and it's even more important in, in the virtual environment because you have less control. They're not in a conference room for a full day or a half day practicing with their group. Then uh, hosting a, a Zoom help desk on your actual virtual hill day. I think this is really important. Um, I will be honest as staff, it's a bit of a letdown on the virtual day, on the hill day, since you're not on Capitol Hill, you're not in the excitement, the members, the attendees, participants, they're excited to be there. You know, if you take a bus or if you're walking to the Capitol, um, different buildings, it's just, you know, the excitement is there. But when you're staff, you're, I'm at home or, um, and it just sort of happens and there's all these virtual meetings happening. So that virtual kind of Zoom help desk uh, gives participants a chance to pop in, ask questions, provide feedback from their meetings, just interact with staff. You know, we have, you know, a few, a couple dozen maybe that pop in throughout the day. Um, but, you know, it's beneficial for, for staff as well as the members. And then I think another key point, it's, in, it's important to be creative with social media. I think we all know the impact that it can have and to promote the issues and, and some of those relationships you have and amplify those with the legislators. Um, we learned after our first virtual fly-in that it can get a little bit stale if you don't have a lot of images. You know, when you're, when you're on Capitol Hill, there's participants taking, you know, selfies or photos of the Capitol, of the dome on a bright blue sky, beautiful day, and it's a great social post. Or they're, they're taking photos with their legislators in or outside of their office. Um, so those, you know, go a long way in, in telling that story and, and promoting the issues that you're, you're uh, advocating for. Um, so in the virtual environment, it's a little bit more difficult. And we do encourage screenshots um, during these meetings, but always ask permission first uh, of the, the legislator or their staff. And then I think if it's you that makes images or you're the designer or you have a team, ask them to create, you know, multiple images and, and different things that can be shared related to your issues, those asks. And um, so you're not seeing that same post, even if the participants you know, add their, their personal touch to it. It just sort of gets stale in your feed. And, and I think that that's important to be, be creative. Yeah, I know our team uses, there are a lot of, there's so many free tools now that make it more accessible to become a designer and make those kinds of posts. Things like Canva is what we use a lot uh, to kind of drag and drop very, like more foolproof than some of the more advanced design tools that can make some of those designs for social posts accessible. I also appreciate how you talk about when you're virtual, you don't have to cram everything into a couple of days and do them back to back to back. Uh, whereas like when you're in DC, you might have training in the morning, meetings in the afternoon. When it's virtual, you can spread those out a little bit and maybe get people when they're a little bit livelier and more attentive than hours and hours and hours back to back. Um, so what does 2022 look like for you all? Obviously we thought that we were going back to in-person Omicron threw a bit of a wrench in that. How are you all planning for this? Maybe we can, maybe we can't world. Great question. We are in the thick of it right now. So we are planning on in-person in May. So we have a little bit of time. Um, in a normal year in person, we like to do it end of February, early March, but we're moving it. We moved it to May. Um, you know, we're monitoring how open Capitol Hill is and, uh, and, we'll be asking our participants really to be flexible. It's not going to be a typical Hill day and that experience that you're used to. So we're being upfront with them. Um, applications are open for us. And once we accept them and they register, you know, we'll be very clear on not expect the unexpected. We don't wanna make them nervous, of course, but just to, you know, be flexible. We've all had, had to adapt during these past few years and uh, we'll continue that for this event. And like I said earlier, it'd be great to just have them in person that training, networking, it's beneficial to our advocacy engagement efforts. So really any in-person meetings will be icing on the cake. Yeah, so I think that's an important point is looking at it as a win if your members can join in person. And if you still talk to that legislator on Zoom, of course, it's maybe not as good as three years ago when we could do things in a normal way, but still better than, than being at home all day. Um, is getting to that networking benefit and some of those receptions and things that you might be able to engage with your association outside of entering the Capitol building, which who knows where that sits at that point in time. Um, do you all notice a difference in the February to May? Because I know there's a lot of organizations tend to 
to do them around the same time of year. Does that change at all the messaging that you're thinking about, the issues you talk about because of where it lies in the calendar? It definitely can, yeah. And you know, that's where we're we're working with our, you know, our I work with our federal staff to make sure and our policy staff that we're, you know, have everything up to date and we're sharing that correct information because we're used to, you know, getting in a little earlier and in, in February. So May is definitely different. And um, but you know, it's still a lot of this. Of course, we want to make an impact on our issues, but getting in front of them or meeting with them and having our members develop and build those relationships with legislators and their staff is, you know, that doesn't change based on when you have it. And I might be getting ahead of myself in this question, so I will jump ahead. Um, I guess one question from the audience that I'll, I'll pose to you now, um, can you talk about some of the, the budgeting that you think about of what costs members might have in coming to DC, what costs you all have, uh, and how that affects your hybrid in-person decision making? Yeah, I wish I had a full answer for you. We're sort of, we're in the thick of it, as I said earlier, um, trying to determine that, you know, I, our, our event, typically we cover um, their airfare or their mileage, um, and then uh, two nights of hotel, two nights of lodging. So, and then any incidentals and things are on their own if it's not a meal that we host during our training and that. Um, so I don't see that changing. I think, you know, typically we're 200 or a little more, uh, attendees. I think we might be a little less, you know, application numbers are, are good so far, but, um, you know, when it really gets down for, to the time for them to register, we might see a few that are like, you know, I don't, I'm going to wait it out and see, and I'd rather go in, you know, a year where I'm going to have more of a typical Hill day. Um, so I think as far as budget, you know, we'll be, will be very similar because because we cover those expenses. Um, and then, you know, we have a consultant, Soapbox Consulting, that we work with that schedules our all of our meetings. Um, so, you know, that's not really going to change. It might change just based on the number that they have to schedule. But um, for the most part, you know, we're still going to print materials. We're still going to do that and kind of make it as normal as possible. So um, it will be interesting, you know, maybe there's something where we have to rent a townhome or we have to do something like that closer to Capitol Hill. So that could definitely change budgeting, but I wish I had a perfect answer for you, but time will tell. Great. And you told me a bit about in our, some of our planning about your state captains and some of the, the leaders that you find among your advocates. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so some of you may have done this for years, but during the virtual setting, we, we realized that practice was important. And when you're not in person, it's harder to do. Um, so we asked during the application if they were willing to be a state captain. Pretty simple role, to be honest, but very important. And I highly recommend it. Um, really, their main role is to schedule a practice session or to be, be the organizer for their state delegation, whether that delegation is two participants or 10 or 12. Um, so, you know, it's just so important, regardless of the size, to be organized. And, and it worked really well. Um, you know, of course, we had some advocates that we knew uh, that we chose and thought would be good state captains, but others we didn't. And it gave them a chance to really take the lead. And, and they did a great job. And, and they're also, you know, it works both ways. Um, they can share questions or concerns from their state group with us. And, you know, it might be a state specific question that we need to clarify about an issue um, or, you know, something that all participants should know. So it was kind of a sounding board as well and, and worked, worked uh, tremendously for us. And I think one thing you mentioned that for you all, you have some folks that you kind of knew from your, your other experiences who'd be good for this, others who sought applications. I think that's a good balance. So we have folks who use Quorum to kind of use like different indicators of who those potential leaders and grass tops folks can be. So we have clients using our gamification features and who has the most points as a quick, easy filter of who should we think about for some of those leadership roles. Um, and then using those folks both to organize other advocates, maybe help schedule a meeting that you're having trouble with because they have stronger relationships. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways that this can carry through. Um, both virtually and in person. So that's awesome to hear that you all have had success with it since putting it into action. Um, you talked a little bit about this, about your training, but can you talk about how you prepare advocates for the event, um, about 
talking points, preparing for a meeting, things like that. Definitely. So of course it's important. It always is. But, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we host that, that training. It's around um, two and a half to three hours, depending, um, you know, about a week in advance. So during that, we really focus on our asks. Um, you know, we have a couple different speakers um, kind of give the current, you know, state and DC what's happening, but we really focus on our asks. And then we have a mock legislative visit. Um, so we have our member physicians participate as, as a mock team and, and one of our staff as the mock legislator. And really just kind of introducing the basics of the Hill visit. You know, we have a combo. We have maybe 75% um, that are returning attendees and, and the other 25 have never attended our Hill Day or maybe any Hill Day. So, you know, really introductions, what is the neurologist discussing the issues and those transitions that they can use. Um, it works really well in Zoom and you can spotlight the three advocates and that mock legislator. So it's a great visual and then that will transfer to the recording. Um, so it's great if they wanna refer or like I said, if they can't attend that, but just to prepare and really letting them hear how they can present this issue. They don't have to get into the weeds, you know, and worry about those little things. Um, and it's not usually a, a gotcha question, you know, from the, from the legislator. So um, then finally, we do have a website that only participants can access. And we put all of our inf event information, um, issue uh, briefs, talking points, uh, with space for them to take notes, background, different things. Obviously, important in virtual, you'd have more paper handouts in person. So that's been successful as well. Yeah, it's it's almost a benefit of virtual in that your practice sessions can be so much closer to the final thing. Whereas you can't practice crowding into a member's office or whatever that setting may be. But Zoom is Zoom. You can practice clicking between whatever you're going to share on screen, uh, and talking through it. So it's, I guess that could be a benefit of, of the virtual environment is getting advocates comfortable with almost exactly what the experience will be like. And then finally, what, what do those meetings actually look like with legislators and staff? How many advocates usually bring to a meeting? How do they use their time? Yeah, we, we try to keep it a little bit smaller, um, in, in the virtual setting, just so more participants have an opportunity to speak and have a role. Um, so the majority of ours are going to be um, three to seven, usually uh, in a meeting. So, you know, obviously some of the Senate, if it's a, a larger state, um, will be will be a bit more. But, you know, they're very similar to in person. Um, uh, a lot of them can be a little bit longer than when you're in person. There's not another group, you know, waiting in the in the lobby of the office, kind of pressuring them to move along. So we have found that. Um, they're still very effective, obviously necessary in promoting the issues and relationships. Um, like I said, we use Soapbox Consulting. They make it really easy. They provide a link for every meeting. They have a help desk to offer tech support. So whether you use another group uh, to schedule or you do it yourself, I think it's important to have you know a couple people dedicated to any tech issues. The good news is, is we're really far into this and uh, people are pretty good with, with the technology these days. Um, and then the office is sent a PDF of our asks in advance of the meeting. And uh, again, we ask the, our participants to treat it as an in-person meeting. So dress professionally, have your video turned on. Most staff in our experience, uh, or most legislators and their staff will have their video on. Um, however, there are some that are audio only. And you know that's one of the main pieces of sort of negative feedback we received in our evaluations from multiple participants was just that their visit was audio only. It just feels less effective to them than one that was video. Um, so not much you can do about that, but just have to be prepared for both and just being upfront with our participants about that. So. And you talked about their dress on the call. Can you tell us about uh, your um, green, green ties? Is that what it is that you all use for your meetings? Yeah, so neurologists are nor known for wearing bow ties. Um, so we wanted to try to stand out a little bit. So we offer, um, our uh, association color is a green color. So we offer these green bow ties and green scarves so they can choose whichever they'd like to wear. And, um, you know, when we're on Capitol Hill, it's great. They're recognized. People say, Hey, you're the neurologist, you know, we've done it for about six, seven years now. So, um, we still encourage them to do it virtually and wear them. And if there's new attendees, we actually will mail them 
uh, their preferred scarf or bow tie. So it works well, you know, it's, it's not too over the top and uh, something that's kind of fun. Yeah, it's a tip we recommend in person, especially like it's not that expensive to get some sort of t-shirt or sticker or button or something that everyone wears, but it makes such an impact walking through the halls of Congress to see waves of people in all these outfits or whatever the, the thing is to show like, wow, these people really showed up uh, and they're really like here to, to push on whatever issue it is they're working on. Wonderful. So I'm going to now pass it over to Megan. And there are lots of questions in the chat. So we will get to lots of those at the end that I think both of you can weigh in on. Um, so Megan, I'm going to dive right in. Um, can you speak to the Institute for Justice's advocacy work um, and where days of the Capitol fit into your strategy? Because I know you all work both in the legal sphere and the legislative sphere. So where does this kind of fit into the program? Sure. So at the Institute for Justice, we're primarily a law firm where we are litigating constitutional cases. And we have a small team uh, that is a legislative team that works across the country on legislation. And one thing that we do both in litigation and legislation is we try to personalize the issues that we work on as much as possible. We always wanna put a human face to the issues that we're working on. And there are always a lot of people who are impacted by the issues that we're working on. So it's usually something that's relatively easy for us to do. Um, so when it comes to our legislative advocacy, we take a constituent centric approach with our advocacy. We are going into a state usually and from the ground up building a coalition to build support for our bills reaching out to people sometimes cold calling people utilizing social media to raise awareness of the issue we may also try to reach out to more traditional forms of media to try to spread the word about the issue but usually we end up with a coalition of people who we can rely on to connect with legislators through that process and I would say the Capitol Day, if our coalition becomes large enough, is really the pinnacle of our advocacy. We try to plan it at a time that is critical to moving the bill forward. And it allows us to show that there are a lot of people who are affected by the bill and to give legislators a feel for how their support for a bill will, will um, actually improve someone's life. And you know this is a, a good issue that they should care about. Um, so we use the Capitol Day really to raise the profile of the bill. Oftentimes by that point, we've had several meetings with legislators, the bill may have move through committee hearings and maybe going to a floor vote, but we just use it to really elevate the um, profile of the bill and bring more attention to the issue that we're working on. And you shared with me some of really creative uh, days that you all have planned. Can you tell, give an example of one of the days at the Capitol that you have worked on recently? Sure. So one area where we work in is to make it easier for home-based food producers to sell food in their communities. And we have brought the home-based food producers together and they've brought samples of their food to share with legislators. So we'll, it, it requires a lot of organization on the front end to make sure that there is enough to share, but we'll actually all get together and have wagons of samples. Um, and in person, we're able to go around to different offices, share sharing the food and sharing stories about the food and, and the person's work and really personalize that issue. Um, now, virtual, it's, it's a lot different, unfortunately. Um, you, know, you don't have that tangible aspect, um, but what we have done still and using still the example of home-based food producers, um, we've, we've had people, um, we've had large Zoom meetings where we've had several people who are in a legislator's district um, come and they're often in their kitchens in the Zoom meeting. So there's that visual behind them. Um, and they talk about their business. They may have their a t-shirt on that represents their business or something about their business. And we also are able to highlight the legislator too, and that the legislator is there and, and cares about their constituents. And I've, I've found that connection has really been impactful during the pandemic when we've had to go virtual and have had some challenges, at, you know, just in this more non-traditional space. Yeah, I like the, uh, this idea of like calling in from your kitchen and things like that. Because I know from a workplace perspective, there's been a lot of talk about how it changes your relationship with your coworkers when you see them on Zoom in their home. 
or maybe their dog is in the background or whatever it may be. And to take that to the virtual lobby day that to connect, it's almost like a mini site visit in one when your issue is related to that person. Um, in that the, one of the whole benefits of lobby days is to get to a face to the issue and being able to do that from your own home takes that even to another level. Um, and so that I think is really interesting and the impact that that virtual has, while not, not quite as good as hands-on, um, still has a unique angle there. Um, so you all work across many states. And so how, obviously with different states having different legislative schedules, size of staff, uh, whether folks are full-time legislators or part-time, how do all those factors uh, alter your plans when you're considering a day at the Capitol? It takes a lot of planning in the beginning. Um, we really have to figure out the culture of the legislature. There are some obstacles in certain state legislatures. The legislators might not have offices um, or you know, only leadership may have offices or they might not have dedicated staff. So it's a little bit more difficult to reach them. Um, those are all things that we take into account when we're planning a capital day. And just because a, a legislature doesn't have you know, traditional offices for every state legislator doesn't mean that we can't move forward with a capital day, but it might mean that we'll change the way that we approach it. Um, we may, for example, reserve an event space in the capital Capital and figure out creative ways to attract legislators to that space and still walk around um, with a lot of people wearing a t-shirt, for example, that has um, something about the bill on it or, or with something that shows that everyone's in a group together so you still see those numbers. Or um, to give another example, we work a lot with food trucks um, to make it easier for them to serve food to customers without having to get redundant permits and licenses in every city where they operate. And they'll park their food trucks in front of the Capitol and that's quite a visual and they can invite legislators to visit their food truck where they get to actually see their business and have that conversation, you know, actually just seeing their physical business there. Um, so there are all kinds of things we'll take into account when we're, we're trying to plan things in the beginning, but it really does take some time to figure out what the structure of the legislature is like. And with it being so different in every state, you do kind of have to consult with people who are on the ground and, and really get a good feel for what's possible. And I think a takeaway there is thinking out of the box that like a, a hill day or a lobby day doesn't have to mean just a whole series of meetings because what, what I'm hearing from you is when you when you, they do have all these offices, you can go meet them where they are, but when they don't, you have to entice them to come to you. And so that kind of differing programming around what entices them to want to talk to me instead of me sh like scheduling t hour by hour meetings and showing up to them um, in some of those states where those meeting spaces aren't necessarily the same. And so you work with coalitions of folks who are, you're not going back to the same advocates over and over again on every bill but it's rather unique communities and coalitions of folks on each issue area um, in a given state or region. Um, so how do you approach finding advocates who are engaged on these issues and bring them to these events uh, and days at the Capitol? So I talked a little bit before about how we use social media to form our coalitions and get the word out a lot of times in the beginning. Um, but we also do a lot of research to try to find people who have a presence online and who appear to be really passionate. Sometimes we're able to find people, sometimes we're not. Um, what I found is that a lot of times the people who are drawn to the, the bills that we're working on and the work that we're doing, they're really passionate about it because it's something that's important to them. So that's something that we, that you know really helps motivate them. Usually it's about their livelihoods and, and their you know their ability to earn a living. So they want to be involved from the get-go. Um, one thing that I do early on, because a lot of times this is all very organic and you know people are coming together, but you, 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 do have, you do have to kind of formalize the coalition quite a bit. I'll hold some meetings early on and share information about what to expect throughout the process. And I play up the Capitol Day quite a bit. Um, pretty much as soon as I start talking with people, I say, and you know, the really exciting part of this is there's going to be a Capitol Day where everyone will get together and we'll be able to show how many people support this. And people get really excited about that. It, it, 
everyone's been working hard to, to push the bill and they love the ability to get together and show legislators just how hard they've been working. Um, so, so that's what I do on my end to really try to entice people to become involved. We do also work within our coalitions with organizations sometimes that support the bills that we're working on. Uh, and when we have an organization that's a part of our coalition that can help drive participation as well. And that might be a little um, closer to how an association would work too. Uh, but it's certainly helpful when you have people coming from different backgrounds and different organizations all working together for the same cause. You just have to make sure you keep everyone on the same page. Yeah, um, which leads into my next question of you and I talked a little bit about some of the challenges of working with a coalition when so many people aren't on the same page. Um, so what is what does that kind of look like when it is folks from different organizations or different perspective, different uh, associations with an issue um, and how that impacts your approach. This is definitely a challenge that we face. Organization is key. And I think being more virtual now, we actually have been able to improve our communication across the board and have larger Zoom meetings with everyone who's interested and have more of an open dialogue about how we're going to pursue things. Um, so we're, we're always working to try to uh, make sure that everybody is on the same page with what we're doing. Um, we want to make sure we have a large enough group of people at a capital day to, to show that a lot of people care about the issue, but if it can if it becomes too large, it can be unmanageable. So that's something that's important to think about. We also want to make sure that people are on message. A lot of times it's people's first time really communicating with legislators and having these meetings, whether that be virtual or in person. Um, so we'll do trainings over Zoom and, and help people prepare, um, have phone calls, conversations, just to make sure that, that the person feels comfortable with meeting with the legislator and kind of has a trial run before. Uh, and that, that definitely helps as well to keep everyone on message and make sure that we're communicating together as a group. And we got a question about ex explaining a little bit more what the coalition actually looks like. Can you give us an example of some of the different stakeholders that you might bring together uh, at one of these events? Yeah, sure. So um, I'll, I'll give you an example on a home-based food bill that we worked on in Oklahoma. We had homemade food producers who were involved in our group. We had farmers. We had an organization called the Young Farmers. Um, I think they were the Young Farmers Coalition, actually, not to define coalition with coalition. Um, but they, they were an organization of young farmers and emerging farmers that were involved in um, wanting to see the law changed. We were working with a local co-op that wanted to be able to sell homemade food. So it was very diverse. We had people from um, you know, different businesses and backgrounds who were working toward the same cause. And we'll, we'll just call the whole group our, a coalition supporting um, the bill because they're all working together from um, different organizations and backgrounds. Awesome, thank you. And so we talked a little bit about how states differ structurally. Have you seen this? How have you seen the impact of virtual versus in-person and how states are open to uh, visits over the last two plus years? Every state's so different and it, it feels like it's constantly evolving too. I definitely think, you know, two years ago, it, it almost seemed like everything shut down for a brief period of time. And we were really thinking, what are we gonna do here? Because it, it seems so different from what we have been doing in the past. Um, but then we got used to being virtual and doing Zooms. And now I think it's much more hybrid. And now we're even seeing some states moving far into the other direction where they really want to be in person. And you, you kind of have to manage on the back end who within your coalition is comfortable being in person um, because you know that's, that's a separate issue too. Um, so I think you know we're gradually getting to a point where I think we will be in person more and we certainly have a preference for having these meetings in person because there are just so many benefits to that face-to-face -face contact in person, that human connection that you, you just can't always get over Zoom. Um, you know, generally speaking, I try to look at the culture of the legislature when we're planning. 
and see if the committee hearings are being held mostly virtual or only in person. That's usually pretty telling about what would be the most effective way to advocate. Um, so that's one strategy that I use. And I also talk with people on the ground. You know, we'll reach out to to different lobbyists or just people who we connect with through our work and, and get an idea about what they've seen through their work and what's the norm in that yeah. state. That's a helpful tip of looking to kind of the actions that they're already doing and whether those are in person or virtual as a an indicator. And I imagine there are some states where it can even vary office to office if they're willing to meet in person or virtually. Yeah, and Minnesota is a great example of that where um, the Senate, which is controlled by Republicans, definitely seem to have a preference for in-person, though they're still doing quite a bit of Zoom meetings. Um, but then the House, which is controlled by Democrats, we're, we're still seeing a lot of virtual. And so before we dive into questions, um, which we have a lot of, so I want to make sure we get to them, um, I just want to give a shout out for Quorum. So uh, Quorum is public affairs software that helps you work smarter and move faster. We offer solutions for stakeholder engagement, grassroots advocacy, legislative tracking. Um, and so some of the ways that Quorum can help your fly-ins. Um, so we offer tools to help schedule those meetings with staffer contact information and our email tool outbox that can help uh, send those emails at scale uh, and get those meetings uh, scheduled on the books. A lot of our clients also use our, in, our interaction logger where they can give uh, a link to their advocates to fill out feedback on their meetings and have that filter back into quorum. Then their lobbyists can go take those notes and run with, uh, with their issues and making an impact based on what the advocates learn in those meetings. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about quorum, uh, you can visit us at quorum.us. Um, but now let's dive into some questions because you all have asked great ones. Um, so I think this actually both of you probably have some insights into this first question, which is, do you incorporate media outreach as part of your fly-ins and what your kind of media strategy looks like? Dave, I know we talked a little bit about media training. So why don't we start with you? Yeah, we do. Um, we host a, a separate advocacy training program where we, where we train uh, our neurologists with, on media skills. Um, and a lot of those attend, but we um, we usually have a member of our communications team that's that attends, and um, you know we do a press release with the issues and and have our leadership or our president available for any interviews. Um, and they do you know they do happen from from year to year or every couple of years um, where they might be featured in an article um, related to the issues we're talking about. Um, but we don't we don't do too much as far as. Uh, media outreach um, for for these events. Megan, do you all have any any media outreach alongside your events? We do. We we sometimes send out press releases as well. Um, other times we'll try to write an op-ed or help someone in our group write an op-ed and have that published. Um, oh, I say have if we can get it published, if we're lucky enough to have someone publish it, um, you know, I think that helps create buzz around the issue and build excitement too. Um, but we find the media is a very effective way to help spread the message and raise the profile of the issue, um, especially on a capital day. Awesome. Next question for Dave. We touched on this a little bit in a couple of our questions. Um, so these might've been answered throughout, but, um, just to make sure we cover it, if the, if the Hill is not open in May, am I correct that you all are still going to come to DC and continue with the parts that you can and hold your meetings virtually? Or what, what does that look like if the Hill does end up being closed? Yeah, that's the current plan. You know, of course, I, I, uh, I don't make the final decision, but, um, but yeah, we are planning on still going in person. You know, like I said, we try to pair it with a few committee meetings, um, you know, on the Sunday prior and receptions and get our younger physicians, residents and those in a fellowship involved. So that's important. Um, and yeah, just, just training them, you know, what are the issues that are important? Um, you know, what's happening now and, and develop, developing them as key contacts. Um, and then that's sort of the, the big question is, then what do you do if it's all virtual on that, that Hill day when you're in DC? Um, we're looking at all options, you know, different things in ballrooms. Do they take them from their hotel room? We've heard of groups doing that where the Wi-Fi is a little better. So a lot to consider, but we are still planning that. Um, and just, we want to be back in person. So we'll see. 
Um, I think a question that either of you could answer, be curious how it differs at the federal and state level, but um, do you see more attrition with virtual fly-ins and how do you think, do you address uh, cancellations or no-shows? I guess either from members or from advocates, we uh, interested in both perspectives. Go ahead, and, Megan, if you want to, I can go after you or whatever you like. Oh, sure. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's easier to get people to attend meetings when it's virtual. Um, there's, there's a lot that people don't have to consider and think about when something's virtual. Um, you know, there's not a drive, maybe they don't have to arrange childcare, or take time off of work. So I think it, it definitely makes a difference. Um, we have had the issue of no-shows from time to time. And, and usually I try to address that ahead of time by making sure we invite enough people where it's not going to be no one's there except us and that someone's definitely there. And I actually don't think we've had an issue where not one person that was invited um, showed up, but sometimes the group's smaller than anticipated. But you know, I, on Zoom, I don't think it's as noticeable um, as it would be in person um, because you can still have that conversation and sometimes it ends up being a bit more personal too. Yeah, I, I would agree. You know, there's always the occasional no show. Um, you know, virtually we've seen just more. I don't know if it's maybe if since their positions and the pandemic has been, you know, obviously very intense um, for most of them and they've had to change their practice things and things, um, you know, maybe their schedule changes. But to be honest, as long as they let us know and let the office know, um, like if it's going to be a no show for that Hill meeting definitely let the office know don't do a no show on that and they'll say okay great you know i i have a, one less meeting today let's reschedule it we have found that that it's much easier to reschedule virtually for a couple of days later or maybe a week or so later when when schedules align um this is a good question do you have any icebreakers that you use when you get onto meetings on with legislators how do you kick off so there isn't that like awkward silence to start off a meeting i can go first um we we don't specifically um encourage anything but we don't i guess discourage we sort of uh we have our uh you know kind of basics like introduce your each of you introduce yourself what is a neurologist the patients you treat that sort of thing so i think you know some of it's just going to depend on the personality of the participant and um, and maybe the, the legislator, the staff, you know, the meetings are usually a little bit different when the leg legislator is there um, in our experience. But yeah, kind of, you know, to each their own, I guess, just don't just uh, just stick to the issues right in the end. Awesome. Um, Megan, this is a question for you, I think. Um, how about how many constituents or coalition members do you all aim for? to make a day at the Capitol effective? Like how many is the kind of minimum that you need to like have that impact felt? I would say 15 to 20. So it's not a huge number, um, but it's enough to have a group of people. And if we can get between you know 20 and 30, that's even better because there's the possibility to divide the group up and um, you know take the group in different directions and expand our reach. Um, but we just try to be able to have a sizable group that's there and traveling around um, meeting with legislators. We, if we have 20, we do not send 20 people into a room at one. Usually we send people um, into rooms about five at a time or so, sure. maybe sometimes 10, but no more than 10. And I guess to go off of that for either of you, um, are you sending a lobbyist along with your advocates or someone from your team to keep things moving, keep things going well? Is there always staff in that call or meeting? Yes, we do. Um, we always have a staff member there that's um, with the group. We have an activism team too that's very talented um, and, and they specialize in grassroots advocacy. So a lot of times our advocates feel really comfortable um, meeting with them and talking with them and, and they can be a com comforting presence in the room for them. Yeah, we offer, offer it up to any state that staff are willing to join to support, especially some of the small or solo states and the, the first time maybe attendees. And then our um, staff are always looking at different meetings who's, you know, kind of a 
maybe an important key legislator or key district that we want to, you know, hear how that meeting goes specifically rather than just the feedback form. Sure. Um, what are some of the most effective leave behind materials that you all have seen? Uh, the question asks, is it links to videos? Is it petitions? Is it research? Is it testimony from volunteers? from your advocates, what are some of those things that make those leave behinds effective? Or send aheads, I guess, whenever that kind of asset process happens. Yeah, I think uh, it, in person, we would, we would have a, a one page for each of our issues. We typically bring three and have three asks. Um, and then we have a document that kind of explains what a neurologist is and that sort of thing. Um, it's important. I mean, we've done a lot more with visuals and graphics, um, on those so that they can utilize them and point to those stats, those highlight those percentages or, or key numbers in the, in the potential legislation. And then virtually we basically took that and made it a PDF and then little things like we anchored. So if they want to just go to this issue on on telemedicine, they can just click that, it'll take them right to that, they can go back to the top. So we just tried to make it as simple as possible um, when creating that virtual leave behind. Awesome. Um, one thing that we see that's really effective with a lot of organizations we work with is sharing what we call custom data, the data about how many advocates uh, live in that member's district or how many employees of your organization or how many facilities uh, or storefronts or whatever it may be. Um, and visually showing that just to, because there are legislators who might not be on the key committees or might not have a pers real personal connection to the issue. And so really ground using some of those documents to ground, like this may not be an issue you think about all the time, but this is why it matters to your district. Some of those things to kind of personalize um, the impact to them and the people that they represent. Um, let me scroll through here because we are not going to get through all of them. So I want to make sure we get some good ones here. Um, here's an interesting one. So um, is your team ever meeting with committee staff on key committees um, or are you mostly meeting just with a legislator's personal staff? We do meet with staff sometimes, um, and we try to include staff, especially if the state legislature has legislators with office and staff. We, we definitely try to include them in the materials that we're bringing and even some of the leave behinds that we're, we're leaving behind. Um, we we want to make sure that they're involved because they can be really impactful for legislators. Um, so I think that that's really important to make sure that you're including them. And then with committee staff, um, you know, sometimes they really do do a lot of the shepherding when it comes to um, figuring out what's going to be heard and helping the chair. And I've actually brought groups of people in to meet with committee staff before, and I found that to be really effective because they don't always see that, you know, mm -hmm. they don't, they don't get to talk with real people about issues. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah, we do outside of our fly-in, but we don't focus on that during our fly-ins. Got it. Um, Dave, you answered this in the chat, but you said uh, about how far in advance you're scheduling your meetings with legislators and sending those schedules out to advocates. Yeah, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we work with a, a consultant to schedule the meetings and we've always done it six weeks out. Um, they, you know, 200 might not seem like a lot of attendees to others. I know they work with groups that are 500,000, that sort of thing too, and some that are 30. So um, their kind of rule of thumb is six weeks and it works really well. You know, you're not going to, most of those aren't going to be scheduled till the last two probably. Um, and you'll, you know, even have a day or a couple days before that they really get, some of them are really finalized, but that's a good rule of thumb in our, in my experience. Great. And I guess when, what kind of, what is the feedback that you're seeking from your advocates after a meeting? What kind of information do you collect uh, and what, what are you looking for there? Yeah, Megan, I can go first. Um, I'll be brief, but you know, if it's, if it is an active piece of legislation, did they co-sponsor, you know, or what was the ask? Did they, what did they do based on that ask? Um, and then just sort of in general, how did it general feedback 
Um, and, you know, did they, if it, if it wasn't um, something that is moving right now, just sort of what questions did they ask? What were they looking for additional data or research that then we'll share with our, our team to, to uh, hopefully act upon and follow up? Yep, yeah, we, we asked the same questions. You know, we want, want to kind of know how the legislator responded, what types of questions they were asking, um, were they interested in co-sponsoring? Um, we, we also ask our advocates to follow up. Um, we, you know, we don't know if they always do, but, but that's something that we ask to just that they send an email thanking the legislator for their time and um, share, you know, maybe sharing the one pager once more or some more information. One tip that I remember, I think Justin, if Justin is still on from uh, the Friends Committee shared with us uh, in the past is when a legislator gives you that like, yes, I support this or no, I'm not interested, I'm, I'm probably not going to sponsor, taking it a step further to ask which part of the bill do you have either the most concerns about or which part of the bill would you be okay with? Um, and that gives the lobbyist who follows up with the meeting a couple weeks later or is in the office the next time a little bit extra insight of color uh, instead of just a blanket. Bills are complex. And so instead of a blanket, like yes or no, getting a little bit extra detail into which part. And so obviously that takes a little bit of advocate education to prepare them to the different parts of a given piece of legislation so they know how to ask that follow up but gave them a lot of insights to be able to uh, have a nugget to, to ping those offices again in the follow-up. Um, uh, Teresa, the, if I can quick shout out yeah. for a quorum too. So virtually, or when you're in person, you're handing business cards usually, right? So you have their email, the staff for follow-up. Like Megan said, you know, we do a kind of a template email and they can make it their own. Um, but a lot of times virtually, they might have lost their email or they don't have it. So They'll email us, can you, if, I think their name was this or it was this name and then we're able to use quorum to in a few seconds, find that staff member's email and send it to them. So thank you for yeah. that. That's awesome. Uh, we're glad to help there. Um, and um, we see that even in person, especially at receptions, things like that, where, uh, you know, you talk to someone and I know their title and their office, but I didn't catch their name. Um, I guess last question, as we're running out of time, a question about time. Uh, how long is your typical meeting? Uh, what on your days at the Capitol? Are you getting a quick five minutes? Are you getting a longer conversation? How much time should folks expect? We're usually getting about 15 minutes. Sometimes it goes a little longer than that, but um, that's usually the norm that we see. Um, usually it's it's not any shorter than 15 minutes. Um, and then sometimes, surprisingly, it goes longer, even though a lot of times I find legislators at, at state legislatures do tend to schedule their meetings in those short increments. But a lot of times they're really interested and want to stay longer and learn more. Yeah. Yeah, ours have been, you know, typically 15 to maybe 30 minutes, pretty, pretty typical somewhere in there. Awesome. Well, as we wrap up a question about time, we are at just about three o'clock. Um, so thank you so much to Megan and Dave for joining us today. I wish you both luck as you continue to uh, plan these events and hopefully we get to go back to doing them in person um, or embrace the parts of virtual that work well and get rid of the parts that we are done with, um, hopefully in the coming months. Um, and so if anyone else has any other questions, uh, feel free to send them our way. Um, my email is Teresa at quorum.us. You're also going to be able to catch our recording uh, at the same link that you all registered at. And um, Dave has put his email uh, in the chat as well um, for folks who have questions for him. Um, so thank you everyone for joining and um, we wish everyone luck with their events.